let's consider the free particle, which has a potential which is zero everywhere. Okay, so if the potential is zero everywhere, then the time-independent Schrodinger's equation uh, is actually not too bad. It's fairly straightforward. We just have minus h bar squared over 2m. The second derivative of psi with respect to x squared is equal to e psi. We can turn this into second derivative of psi with respect to x squared is minus k squared psi, where k squared, well actually k itself, is 2me over h bar square root. Excuse me, h bar squared there. Uh, a couple of things about the free particle. Uh, because it's free, there are no boundary conditions. Uh, and that means there are no quantized energies for the free particle. In particular, you can have any k value or any e value you want. Also, the solutions to the free particle um, are, well, you could write them as sines and cosines. We're actually going to write them in terms of complex exponentials. So we'll write solutions psi of x as a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. That tells us that the full time-dependent wave function is the a e to the i k x b e to the minus i k x times e to the i energy t over h bar. This energy e up here is h bar squared k squared over 2m just by our relationship between e and k. And so if we distribute that exponential into the parentheses here, we can get the total wave function psi as a function of x and t, which looks like a e to the i k x minus h bar k over 2 m t plus b e to the i k x plus h bar k over 2 m t. And this is a very useful way to write it because we notice we have this combination of, say, x plus or minus vt, where v is h bar k over 2m. So this kind of looks like uh, a set of waves where one of these waves is a right-moving wave, and then another one is a left-moving wave. So our general wave function is a sum of a right-moving wave and a left-moving wave. It might be more useful to write this in a more compact notation. So to write this in a more compact notation, we'll say capital Psi is equal to a e to the i kx minus h bar k squared over 2mt, where now k can be greater than 0 and it can be less than 0. So k takes all values. It could be 0 as well. Okay, so note if we take p hat, the momentum operator, times our free particle wave function, so that's h bar over i d by dx of psi k, we just get, after some algebra, we get h bar k times the wave function back again. So that's kind of nice. That tells us that the wave function psi of k is an eigenvector, or, or sorry, an eigenfunction, since we're talking about functions, of p hat with an eigenvalue of p equal to h bar k. Um, and so that's a really nice relationship. We now know that this free particle has a definite momentum, h bar k. Unfortunately, there is a problem with this wave function. The problem with this wave function is that if you integrate from negative infinity to infinity of psi squared dx, well, so doing that integral and using our expression above, we get a squared integrated over dx. I can pull a squared out of the integral since it's a constant. So I get a squared times, well, infinity. And that should be equal to 1 because the integral here should be the total probability of finding the particle somewhere. So unfortunately, we find that a free particle with a definite momentum, a definite p, definite momentum, uh, just doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because it violates uh, one of our postulates of quantum mechanics. 
In particular, it violates the postulate that our uh, wave function be normalizable. So we are not allowed to have a free particle with a definite momentum. If we know exactly where it is, then we know nothing about its position. But we can consider a sum of lots of different momenta, lots of different k values. And we can make this happen in such a way that the wave function itself is normalizable. So what do we mean by this? Well, consider uh, in the infinite square well case, the wave function capital of psi uh, for a generic wave function was a sum c sub n, psi sub n of x, and then e to the i e n t over h bar where we're summing over the individual stationary states. So this was a discrete set of states that we were summing over. But now we want to turn it into a continuous set of states, as now the energy can be continuous, not just discrete. And so we can do that. So now a general wave function for a free particle will look like an integral instead of a sum. There's a 1 over square root of 2 pi out front. 5k e to the i kx minus h bar k squared over 2mt dk. Where here, the 1 over square root of 2 pi is just a convention factor, so don't worry too much about it. The phi sub k is playing the role in the continuous case, uh, as c sub n was in the discrete case. Uh, we can interpret that as the amplitude of our wave function having the momentum k. And then the dk is just telling us that we need to do a sum over all k values, which here is a continuous sum rather than a discrete sum, or rather it's now an integral. So we now find that capital Psi is, to put in our language, is a superposition of many different free particles with different momenta. Uh, we give that a name. So we call that a wave packet. A wave packet is a sum over lots of different momenta for our particle. Depending on the function phi of k, this can be normalized. Not every phi of k can be normalized, however. So in future videos, we'll look at some examples of that.